afternoon on this terrific Tuesday, uh, September 1st. Wow, isn't it great to have a refreshing day of rain in the midst of uh, August, and uh, or actually September now. <laughs> it's a gift of God to have rain on the hot, these hot days of the last part of summer. I'm wearing my Thunder outfit today because the Oklahoma City Thunder came back and beat the Houston Rockets last night in a great, great playoff game that was really enjoyable. Seems like my Thunder this year either lose by 25 or win by three. <laughs> they are the cardiac Thunder these days. Uh, but I'm still rejoicing over that game. What a, what a great basketball game that was. Exciting game. It's also exciting to examine James's words to us this this afternoon in our Facebook Live Bible study. You know, I, I love the way God orchestrates things. Sometimes uh, he puts some things together that we don't even think about at all. Last Sunday, we kicked off our uh, study of Paul's very passionate letter uh, to the people in Galatia. And uh, he uh, we gave this equation of a kind of an overview of this letter that Paul wrote when we said, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And Jesus plus anything else equals nothing. Grace is truly free for all. And we talked a lot about religion and how Jesus came to abolish religion and also about works, uh, that works do not save us. And so today, we're going to be looking at a letter that James, uh, Jesus' half-brother, James, wrote, and he reminds us that the gift of freedom that we have because of grace comes with the responsibility of action. Or we could say it in this way, the privilege of freedom comes with the purpose of mission, and part of that mission that we have is living out our faith in a world. Uh, James here before long in James chapter 2, we'll talk about the fact that works, uh, faith without works is dead. So freedom and responsibility go hand in hand. It's something that you can't have one without the other. So today we're going to dive into these verses and attempt to put them in the context of God's uh, plan and will for our lives, our whole plan. It's a big task. But you and I are up to it, and the Holy Spirit is certainly available to guide us uh, and help us as we try to understand and attempt to live out these verses here at the end of James chapter 1. Uh, imagine, just for a moment, about receiving or getting advice, uh, the wisest advice you've ever had from the world's leading expert on a vitally important topic. You hear it, you know, you agree with it. You affirm it, you say, yeah, man, that's great stuff. I really like that stuff. But you don't actually follow it. You don't adjust your life to live any differently than you did before you received that truth or that little bit of wisdom. You had. This is the delicate issue that James tackles for us today in James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27. Uh, I'm going to read them for these verses for you. So if you have your Bibles or if you got your phone sitting by, uh, pick up your Bible app and uh, turn to James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27. James writes, Don't just listen to God's word. You need to, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you are just fooling yourself. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. That's through verse 25. There are mornings I get up and I look in the mirror and I would like to forget <laughs> what I look like. Uh, it, it is amazing as your hair gets a lighter shade and uh, um, uh, turns a little different color, you look in the mirror and you go, gosh, is this the same guy or not? And then you get a new driver's license. I had to get a new driver's license this year. So I decided to get one of those real ID pictures, you know, our driver's license. It took about 10 days to get it back from the state. And I opened it and looked at it and I thought, who in the world is this old guy in this picture? I had a white background behind me 
And I just kind of blended into it. There's just some beady eyes looking out toward it. So if I get stopped and they ask to look at my license, they're going to say, sir, you sure this is your car? Let me see your registration also. <laughs> so we've been given a great gift, and that's the Word of God. It's like a mirror looking at us, a Jesus book. Reading that book, studying it, memorizing it, discussing it, hearing it, they're all good things, very good things, but they are not the ultimate purpose of the book that we call the Bible, the Word of God. That transformation process or the purpose of God's Word is to transform our lives. It's to reshape our lives in order for us to glorify and honor God. But that transformation process includes living the life that Jesus says, living the life which he gives for us in his word. And the issue so often for me is that I hear what Jesus says, but I don't do what Jesus says. And as I read the words of life, a term that the Old Testament writers often uh, talk about, as I read the words of life, or I hear the word of life as it's proclaimed or taught in a class or something like that, and I hear it explained in the context of which it was originally written, um, what do I do with those words or concepts? How, how do I apply it to my life? Am I just going to listen to them and say, hmm, huh, that's interesting, or that's cool, or that's kind of amazing, wow, God's pretty neat, or will I actually take the risk and pay the price of building my life around those words that I read and hear? Will I put into practice what Jesus says? So the writer of this letter, James, Jesus' half-brother, for many years, he rejected Jesus' words. He did not like to think or did not want um, to comprehend that his older brother was the Son of God. And so for many years, he rejected Jesus' words. Yet when he saw Jesus dying the horrible death of crucifixion, and he saw the pain and suffering on the eyes and face of his mother, Mary, um, he, it touched him. But it was the resurrection that changed his life. One of the people that stood in front of Jesus, that Jesus stood in front of after his death was James himself. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul mentions this, this appearance, and he says that he talked to James and to the rest of the apostles. And so after that experience, James became a leader in the early church. He became a person um, who led a growing number of men and women who saw Jesus who heard Jesus, many of them saw his miracles, and they, as they observed and listened to what he taught, they concluded, finally, here's somebody who makes sense when they talk and they, they teach. Here's someone who knows God and understands the human heart. Here is the wisest man I've ever been around. And so they took that opportunity to learn from Jesus and arrange their life around him and to do what he said. And James did that. He decided he would gladly give up anything and sacrifice everything in order to practice what his half-brother said. And as James and the other followers devoted themselves to doing what Jesus said, they changed the world, and they never, ever regretted what they did. No one who has ever devoted themselves to the Word of God and to living out what Jesus said, ever look back on their life with regret. Never. In 2,000 years, they haven't. But they all reached a point where they said, doing what Jesus said is the most important thing in my life. And I will jettison everything and anything that gets in the way. I'm going to show that what I hear and what I, I, I see as I watch Jesus, as I live out his words, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do what I hear. Now, the truth about me and <laughs> probably about you is we tend to be selective doers. There are some tendencies we fall into in this area. We're very selective about our obedience. 
I will do things that come easy or come naturally to me. And we'll take other things from the menu and leave some alone. We focus on whether other people are living it out, but we don't focus on whether or not we are living it out. Do you ever find yourself after um, hearing a message or hearing somebody teach and saying, boy, I sure wish so-and-so would have heard that. Uh, they really need to hear that lesson. They really need to hear what uh, that message was all about. I, I tend to be in deniable deniable denial about my own practicing of the truth but I want other people to practice the truth and James infers there's a danger that's attached to that approach and if I don't monitor this uh, internally very carefully I'm capable of self deception and James's warning is be doers of the word not mere, merely hearers only who deceive themselves. Now, James is not talking about those who are openly defying God and they know it. Uh, James says it's possible to hear the word and deceive myself by thinking because I hear it and affirm it that I'm doing it. And James says it's possible for us to live in denial or self-deception. And here's how that goes. I may hear a message on a particular subject. Let's just say the importance of humility in my life. And I agree with it. I affirm it with all my heart. I, I know that's true. Uh, it's a great character quality, I think. Pride and arrogance are ugly, and I, and I realize that. And I don't like to be around arrogant people. Most, most of us do not. Someone praises me, and, and I may feel awkward. I know that I need to be humble. And I remember that uh, <laughs> I'm not as good as some people think, nor am I as bad as other people think. <laughs> uh, I need to have balance. I seek then humility in my life. But then put me in a situation where somebody is getting all the praise and attention. Then I start finding out the truth about myself. I find myself saying foolish things, self-promotional things. Jealous words eek out of my mouth and they just leak from every pore. I look in the mirror and I think, I am so deceived. When I hear a teaching on the beauty of humility, it resonated with me. And I thought of myself of truly wanting to become a humble person and that I am a humble person. But then when I look at my actual behavior, I find that I am deceived. Now, I can follow that up by putting myself under law and condemn myself and shame myself and vow that I will work harder so I can please God in that area. Or I can thank God for his spirit who lives inside of me, who corrects me and urges me to repent towards growing, to, uh, towards having that attitude and keeps me growing towards maturity in my life. One is a religious response. The other is a grace response. Now, in the next three verses, in verses 25 through 27, we will need to dig deep and remind ourselves of context. Context is so very, very important. And I uh, as I listen to the debate and the words that are thrown around on Facebook and on TV and elsewhere and kind of our cancel, cancel culture uh, ideas that seem to be flowing all over the place these days, I think that people forget about the whole idea of context. Context means understanding the historical uh, situation in which somebody is writing or speaking and the events surrounding that and the events surrounding today and putting those into the context of today. And it also context uh, uh, reminds me or, or tells us that we need to dig a little deeper to understand why a person is writing something, why a person is saying something and what the, the situation was in the, in, going on at that time. And so when James writes these verses and he talks about law and liberty and and religion, it's important to understand the context in which he's writing. Verse 25 says, the man who looks in, 
intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed by what he does. Now, when we hear the word law, as we talked about last week, law sometimes puts us under shame and condemnation. Law can point out what we're doing wrong, but it can't help us necessarily to overcome the tendency to do, overdo, uh, overcome that which we're doing wrong. Uh, we should not think when, when James talks about the word law here, that it's a reference simply to uh, the commandments of God or rules of people, the Ten Commandments or any other commandments that, that elaborate on those ten that God originally gave us. James is writing as a Jew who is steeped in the ancient Hebrew scriptures. He knew them word for word, the Torah, the Hebrew word talking about the first five uh, books of the Old Testament. It does it usually is translated law, but it really means teaching. It includes the entire Bible, not simply the, com the commandments per se. It includes principles for living, but it's the entire revelation of God, theology, ethics, philosophy, all that put together. And in this case, I think we can say it's, it's equivalent to the implanted word of God within our life. And James says the law of God is the law of liberty. Why? Because as the Bible teaches us in many ways, obedience to following Jesus, obedience to our creator who made us and uh, knows how we tick, obedience is one of the most powerful tools of finding true freedom. Everybody wants to be free. Everybody wants to be free. It's one of the most powerful of all human motivations, but it's also the least carefully defined or understood. So what is freedom? I think oftentimes in our times today, we, we talk about freedom without giving much thought to the, uh, to the question. Uh, and we, we don't understand what liberty is all about. We define freedom as thinking whatever one wishes to think and living however one pleases to live. But that's not liberty as, as the Bible understands liberty. And of course, it's not really not liberty as human beings crave it either. Indeed, liberty in that conception, as human experience really demonstrate, is more like bondage. Because self-indulgence and foolish, willful, selfish behavior produces human misery in our life. It, it introduces into our life an increasing captivity to destructive patterns of thought and life. And it never produces a satisfying, useful, or contented life at all. And so, this is what James says. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, religious? and yet does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart, and this man's religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress, and refusing to let the word world corrupt you. Now, before we look at those three things that are kind of uh, great things to evaluate where we are in life and our on our ability to carry out the word and carry out what Jesus has, uh, example of, that he's laid before us. We need to understand this very, very unique word that James uses here in verses 26 and 27. Actually, this word is only used four times in, all, in the whole New Testament. Three of them are in these two verses. And it's not found anywhere in the in secular Greek writings at all. It's used that some of the church fathers use it later on in the second century as they make comments on James's writings and also as they talk about in the Maccabean period uh, some of the things that the uh, uh, Jewish Maccabeans who led a revolt against Greece uh, talked about the practices of the Jewish people. So the word that James uses is so unique it's different than any other time the word religion is used any place in the, in the, in the New Testament. It's, the word is thraskia, and it's, uh, uh, gosh, 
every Greek scholar I checked as I, I worked on this last couple of days, in one way or another said that there's no English word that's adequate to render the meaning of this particular Greek word. It seems to come from the verb which means to tremble. And it's used primarily, that verb to tremble is used primarily um, the idea of the fear or dread of ancient gods. And this fear or dread led to performance of certain external um, services in their life, uh, events in their life, and the practice of worship of these gods. So it was used of a practice that springs not for, from the love or for the love of God, but out of a fear of one of these ancient gods. So, or the dread of it. So now James uses it and he kind of twists it a little bit. Um, and he doesn't use religion the way Jesus often talked against religion. He uses religion to say, hey, if you if you do um, certain works in your life out of the love for God, that, that leads, this leads to some practices that brings great honor to God. It's not out of the fear that if you don't do these things, you're going to lose your salvation. It's because grace has given you eternal life and given you a life that you respond to God by these practices. And so James is taking a word and, and creating kind of a new context for it. And so now please remember the context of, of what James is talking about. He's talking about being a doer of the word. And that means that there's some work involved in it. He goes deeper onto the subject and he says, it's not enough to just do or to work, but that we should also be very careful about the motive of our worship or service to God. It should be not dread, but love. And then and only then we'll be happy in doing the work of God. If we do what we do because of fear, uh, then we shall be more apt to do it out of grandiose notions about ourselves and to transfer or transmit those notions to others who live around us instead of out of our love for God. So what does this mean for us? Acts of religion, as, as James is talking about, are not bad in and out of themselves, but they are not a works righteousness type of thing. James is not saying that you can earn brownie points by these three actions, keeping your tongue in check and caring for the marginalized and purity. Those three hour areas instead come out of, um, they're just the natural outcome of a relationship with Jesus who has gifted you with salvation and a new life. And that's a very important distinction. Now, if we, have cl if we claim to receive that gift of grace in our life and we have this relationship with God, then the taming of the tongue, serving the disadvantaged, and pursuing purity flows out of that relationship with God. There's not a burdensome to it. There's not an exhaustion to it. Instead, there's a joy as we, as we do that. Now, we accept God's gift of salvation by faith. And James will say in the next chapter, the faith is, that does not accept it, I'm sorry, faith that does not express itself is not real. Or, as you probably heard it from the King James, faith without works is dead. So, faith needs to express itself. Now, this is a rhetorical question, all right? So, we get into a little application of what James says. Have you ever, have you ever met anyone who talks too much and listens too little? <laughs> In that list of names that is going through your head like right now, probably should have your own, all right? Because we've all been slow to hear and quick to speak and quick to anger. It's, it's amazing that something as small as the tongue can do the amount of damage that it does. And we use our tongue often to criticize uh, other people. We use it to legitimatize ourselves. We use it to grandiosa eyes ourselves, make, make statements about ourselves that are not true. We gossip. We speak prejudice. We speak out li outright lies. And James clearly connects the use of your tongue with the internal state of your heart. To the extent that you control your tongue is an 
index, listen to me, it's an index to your yieldedness to the Holy Spirit within your life. Wow, that's pretty sharp. Now, the second area that James asks us to examine in our life is cultivating compassion for the poor and the needy. Who are the widows and orphans in our society today? Well, the Bible talks about those people who are disadvantaged because their caretakers and their support systems have been removed from them through no fault of their own. And I think James wants us to create some new eyes to see them, some new ways to value them. And so often the marginalized, we just step on them or we look away because we don't want to really engage with them. And Jesus says, hey, to care for the orphans and the widows and their distress, that's, that's good. And that flows out of the heart of God. Matter of fact, if you just went through a list of Bible verses in the Old and New Testament that talk about God's heart for the poor and those who are uh, what we might call the down and out, we would be here all afternoon looking at them. So he goes on, talks about a third way, and that is to pursue purity. As followers of Jesus, we pursue values that are countercultural. And the world often has a huge influence on our thinking. I think the pathway to purity is found um, in counteracting our attempts to please ourselves rather than acting in ways that serve and help others. Often how we get into impurity are things that are we uh, are very self-centered. Um, ways to attract attention to ourselves, And Jesus says, no, the way to, to experience joy in your life is through by serving others. It would be easy to get on a rant about the ways that we attempt to please the world around us rather than build a relationship with the God who loves us the most, but that's not our purpose here. The purpose is to remind us is that as we hear the word, that the pure way to, the undefiled way to be able to build that relationship and continue to build that relationship with God is to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, that we look out for the needy, that we, that we use our tongue to bless instead of curse, that we serve and that we help others. And James says when we're doing that, we're living out what God has placed within us. Hey, thanks for joining us on this terrific Tuesday to explore God's Word in the book of James. Just a couple of reminders real quick, and that is that this next Sunday, Labor Day weekend, Brady Galloway, who was our intern this past summer, uh, has gone back to college, but he'll be home this weekend, and he's going to be sharing the Word with us from Galatians chapter uh, chapter 2. Actually, chapter 1, verse 17 through chapter 2. It's a long passage. He's He's been working on it. And it's going to be a great message. I hope you'll be here to hear God's word this next Sunday. And then next week, uh, Jim Landis will be back with us as, he, as we continue our study on Tuesdays of the book of James. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us today. And take your umbrellas out so you don't melt when you get out in the rain. Goodbye. Thanks a lot for being with us today.